Hey everyone, Brian Beeler here with the Storage View Podcast, and today we've got an exciting conversation, or what should be exciting, uh, with Fungible. And uh, Fungible is really interesting because they're taking the notion of all of these resources that get tied up in the data center and trying to find a way to disaggregate them and, and, and roll them into individual balls for applications and do all sorts of other stuff. So rather than me explain what I think they're doing, why don't we bring in Brian Bukloski, uh from Fungible. Brian, thanks for joining us. Hi, Brian. Uh, nice to meet you. So. I, I gave the briefest and roughest of introductions of uh, Fungible. Why don't you take over and, and give it to us from your perspective? Okay, so we uh, we started five-ish years ago uh, with a, a very bold vision to uh, transform the the transform the data center and to bring hyperscale infrastructure to the masses and to give customers the ability to. Uh, take advantage of everything they like about the cloud and the hyperscalers, the the agility uh, that they offer, the uh, what can be compelling economics, but be able to do it in their own data center and you know achieve financial benefits that way as well as technology benefits that way. And uh, our our co-founders, one is Pradeep Sindhu, and Pradeep, uh, well known in the industry, is a co-founder of Juniper as well. Uh, and the other is Bertrand Serlet, and Bertrand was a direct report to Steve Jobs at Apple for quite some time, uh, working on uh, on the operating systems there. And what their what they noticed is that uh, Moore's law is somewhat plateauing, and that the the increasing demands on the data centric parts of workloads. So the uh, the networking and storage level, the customer needs are increasing at a far more rapid rate than Moore's law is able to keep up with, and there's an increasing dichotomy between what customers want and what general purpose CPUs are capable of delivering. A similar dynamic to what happened with sort of the floating point, highly computational world and the advent of GPUs. And we saw an opportunity to significantly transform customer infrastructures by uh, uh, building the fungible DPU or data processing unit specifically for those data centric workloads. And uh, we developed the chip as well as several uh, uh, commercial solutions that are instantiations on top of the chip. Okay. Well, it's interesting because you're talking about uh, the chip, which is important, and we'll get into that. Um, but large IT vendors have been talking about this concept of better leveraging your assets for since the beginning of time. I mean, you've been at EMC and NetApp and Pure and other places, and you've probably told or heard told a similar story before. Uh, we've seen demos, you know, from from Dell years ago about. Hey, wouldn't it be neat if you could take the unused stuff from over here and mix it with the CPUs that are over here and then have a thing that's that's higher utilized? But in terms of broad adoption outside of HPC or certain government agencies or, or whatever, I mean, there's no one's really had success with this. And, and I'm just wondering if it's because it's complex, complicated, never really worked well, or if it required something like the the chip that you're talking about to be able to really leverage these things the right way? Uh, well, sometimes what are really great ideas need need physics to catch up with them and the available <laughs> okay. technologies to catch up with them. Um, you know, somebody may have had the idea of an electric car that could go hundreds of millions of dollars on a charge a hundred years ago, but if batteries just physically didn't have those capabilities then, you know, that doesn't mean that there will never be an electric car. It was just the idea was a little before the time. Too, it, too it early. Okay. Realized. Uh, and, but what we have realized is, to your point, um, what you can do with traditional components is somewhat limited. And if we could have brought all the benefits that we're bringing, like for, uh, like we were chatting beforehand, one of the, uh, uh, places I worked previously was solid fire and where a very similar storage, the storage instantiation of the DPU 
is fairly similar architecturally. It's node-based, it's network attached, it's network-based data protection, um, but each fungible node is 30 times more performant than the, a solid fire node. And solid fire has some really great, and NetApp has some really great software engineers and we didn't get a 30x improvement just because of our software. We got a 30x improvement because it's paired with silicon that's custom designed, custom built for what we're asking it to do. Um, mm -hmm. And to me, one of the really ex exciting things about the storage product is, is the validation it provides to, to the opportunities available to the with the fungible DPU. So what we've proved, the storage cluster delivers great performance, uh, a great feature set we can get into later, but it also validates that uh, in this case, uh, function specific silicon delivers performance well, in, uh, uh, well ahead of what general purpose silicon can deliver for data centric workloads. Well, so how do you think about that relative to the, the DPU? Because a storage array in itself, I mean, the limitations are kind of everywhere from an architectural standpoint, right? And one of them is is the, the CPU, right? Because the arrays never have latest gen CPUs. So they're, they're normally some six or eight or 12 core way down bin and normally, what, two generations old from whatever Intel shipping at the time. Now AMD is involved, but we're not really seeing uh, adoption there at the stored traditional active active storage node kind of thing. Um, they've gotten better on networking, so we're seeing you know, at least 10, 25, sometimes 50 or 100, depending on uh, or 64, 32 if you're looking at fiber, depending on the the array. But on the other side, if you take a high end server node with dual proc latest whatever and then put software on top, we still don't see all the performance available either because even though you have the highest end hardware, there are processing inefficiencies, software inefficiencies, driver issues between components. So while the storage array tends to be much more hardened, much more reliable and predictable, the higher end server doesn't necessarily rocket those, those numbers all the way through the roof. And so what it sounds like you're saying is that because of the way uh, you have both your application, your software side, and the, the dedicated silicon, that, that now that combination is right to get the performance out of all these individual components that, that both of the scenarios that I described aren't unable to do. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting if you look at the storage industry and like you point out where what traditional storage products are capable of. So if you think of a storage array as a CPU surrounded by a network, it could be a fiber channel network, could be an IP network, and also surrounded by, and, and we'll, we'll talk about very high performance uh, SSDs. Mm -hmm. uh, and storage systems haven't been able to drive the network to full capability, uh, and they haven't generally been able to provide the full capability of all the SSDs behind them unless they're unless they make a, a very specific decision to go very storage light on their architecture uh, because they want to be able to you know actually realize the drive speeds and mm -hmm. you know the challenge there is that what's between the network and the drives uh, doesn't have the capability to feed either side of it at full speed. So with us, it's it's the silicon, but it's also having written software specific to that silicon. So for example, like we we run our compression algorithms on chip, um, and with software that was written specifically for the DPU. So there's we run compression at line speeds. And there's not this sort of, do I want to save disk space or do I want to lose some performance? Um, now, in a world of 10 years ago or 20 years ago, you know, maybe you didn't need the full capability of all of the spindles available to you or full performance, and you didn't need the full capability of the network available to you. So it was okay that 
you had, you know, uh, 80, 80 gigabytes a second worth of spindles, but you're only pushing 10 out of it. Um, but if you think of modern workloads, you know, AIL, AI workloads, ML workloads, mm -hmm. deep learning workloads, um, you know, the choke point is, is feeding data in and getting data out. Um, and the traditional architectures, you know, become a choke point in that. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, we see that, uh, you know, in the server scenario, we can saturate two eighty three eighties with a couple SSDs doing some intensive database workloads, and that's not even mm -hmm. that hard. So now if we can do that with uh, four or five SSDs, you've got 20 more sitting in that server that you may not be able to do a whole lot with if you're, if you're hammering the CPU that hard. Uh, but on the storage array side too, I mean, similar sorts of problems under under duress. The you know that you start to see the breakdowns in uh, either CPU, maybe a little bit in DRAM, but definitely networking as well. Um, but so take a step back and talk about your DPU for a minute, because obviously we're seeing those come to fruition in a number of different ways now, right? They're showing up on NICs, um, yeah. you know, that, that uh, NVIDIA Mellanox are, are making. Uh, Xilinx is doing smart NICs, too. We're seeing it show up in SSDs, in computational storage uh, from uh, the Xilinx and Samsung deal or NGD or ScaleFlux. Uh, there's, there's so many ways these, these types of products are being used. I think we're starting to get to a point where it might be confusing to understand uh, what a DPU is, how, why isn't this just a fancy new FPGA or ASIC or whatever, and then where you apply it in terms of your strategy on how to leverage this new way of, of computing. So yeah, I know you're not a, a systems engineer, but at a high level, how do you guys think about this or communicate it to customers to help clarify what exactly this DPU concept is in your nomenclature and how best to apply it to your uh, overall infrastructure? Yeah, I think we're, I think we're beyond the point where it's getting confusing, uh, <laughs> and, and where where at the point it is confusing, um, and it's been an evolution for us as well. Um, and you know, one of the conclusions that that we've come to, which. Uh, uh, shouldn't have taken us that long to come to, but it did, is uh, in the end, customers care a lot more about what it does than how it does it. Okay. Um, and so what we are you know, increasingly focused on is uh, discussing the attributes of what, of the benefits we provide. Um, and then one, like we have the world's fastest scale out block storage system with, with uh, up to 15 million IOPS per node in a seamless scale out architecture with robust quality of service, um, uh, the ability to run file workloads on top of it. Uh, so there, there's a lot of really, and we can point to customer pain points. Like if you have um, you know, lots of bare metal workloads that um, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't have to make the, that trade off between uh, the inefficiency of locally attached storage and the availability issues with locally attached storage versus the performance you really want to get. Um, so our messaging started with basically, unfortunately, the way I started this conversation, which we have a DPU and here's what our DPU does. Uh, and we've tried to evolve it into here. Here's, here's what we can do for you. And when customers question the how can we do that? Like if I say, you know, I'm 30 times more performant per node than what you're using today, you know, there's good reason for a customer to say, I don't believe a small company can do that. And then we can explain. Well, sure. I, I was going to ask that next. I mean, 30x is a big number. And we saw those claims and you know those, those claims from your prior companies when mm -hmm. When, when the new hybrid and all flash guys were coming into the scene, like Pure, like you know some of the other guys, Tejile and whoever else at the time, they were hammering the incumbents, including Dell and EMC and HP, 
on performance and usability. Those are like the, the two things, mm -hmm. right? We're, we're more performant because we're using Flash. We're, we're, co we're more cost effective and we're prettier. So three things, right? Yep. And, and even back then, there might have been an argument around data reduction when the other guys were only on hard drives. Um, but 30x is a big number. So talk, yep. uh, talk to, to me about how you get there. Because uh, we have an engine specifically built to do what it is we want done within data-centric workloads, um, and others have it. So it's, okay. it's, it's, not, it's not like our, our people who write compression algorithms are 30 times smarter than the people at our competitors who write compression algorithms. You know, mm -hmm. we, we spent five years building an engine that would run it better, uh, and we can take advantage of that. And, you know, having a programmable processor that we've already built a security stack, a networking stack, storage stack, uh, uh, and knowing what it's capable of for data centric workloads, you know, opens up a whole window of possibilities regarding not only where we can take it in the future, but where our customers will be able to take it. Um, because we couldn't build a storage system if you couldn't program the processor. Um, and you know we're increasingly giving customers more flexibility to program that processor themselves. So it's a combination of here's the initial commercial instantiations from us, our, okay. uh, our storage system, our fungible data center, um, and our PCIe cards with a DPU on it. Um, but you know we're at the beginning of a long journey um, and having and having this underpinning that others don't um, just you know lets us the potential of where we can take it is uh, much broader than than I think anyone else has the opportunity. Well, so it's interesting you hit on something there just in passing, but I want to uh, hit that one more time. So your your chip is programmable, and you said that even customers can can tune that. I'm, with mm -hmm. a little education, I, I hope. Yep. Uh, so, so for those that have a really good understanding of their workloads, can tune it further for their specific use case. Yep, absolutely. And when we look at, um, you know, being able to help customers with deep learning work workloads, machine learning workloads, you know, one of the ways we'll be able to do that is by embedding some of the logic that those workloads depend on uh, into the silicon. And uh, you know, if you think of my 30x performance advantage, you know, some amount of that is I can continue to just make 30x more performance available for the core storage functions, or I can let customers use some subset of that to do mm -hmm you know, optimize other parts of their data centric workloads that are important to them. Hmm. So let's go backwards now a little bit because we kind of jumped into this DPU notion and these uh, either chips or cards that are within your storage product. Mm -hmm. um, but go one, one more step back because the whole stack, the whole fungible stack includes uh, top of rack switching, compute nodes, composer nodes, kind of walk us through uh, from that entire infrastructure standpoint, how you guys think about the individual components and how you're piecing those together. Um, we have the fungible data center, what we call the fungible data center, and it is uh, a basically a bare metal cloud in a box. So it includes from top of rack switches to industry standard servers with our PCIe cards in them, uh, as well as the fungible storage cluster. So if you are uh, the application owner, if you're the um, uh, responsible for the AI environment uh, e at either potentially, it, you could be a service provider wanting to offer it as a service, or you could be running it for your own organization instead of having to figure out this brave new world yourself, you know, we deliver it turnkey. Uh, mm -hmm. And in, 
uh, from the time it is powered up, plugged in, it's on the network, you know, you can be deploying your workloads in under five minutes. And you can offer your customers a marketplace of workloads, like, uh, you know, here's a certain server type called Brian that, you know, we deploy often. And any time a customer wants an instance of Brian, they will request it, they will request it, it will assign the amount of cores, the amount of storage, the other uh, attributes of, of that function. And when you're done with it, you can disaggregate it. So, uh, but for companies out there that they're trying to sell composability, you know, it's really, really hard to build a new market, um, especially if you're a younger company. But so our approach to that is we take the risk out, we deliver it top to bottom, we support it top to bottom. Uh, the other approach we have is the commercial instanti instantiations of the DPU, uh, like the storage cluster, where you can deploy the storage cluster, which in and, which in and of itself is a composable disag disaggregated architecture. It just happens to be all storage nodes. Uh, and you can then build upon that towards, um, you know, more that future vision of, of hyper disaggregation and hyper composability across your whole data center environment. So it seems to me then you're a better fit for more dynamic environments that have a lot of applications that spin up and down. I mean, because... 30x on the performance side is one thing, but with the speed of a lot of flash and technology these days, there may not there may be some customers that are just humming along in a traditional uh, environment and they're fine with the performance they're getting. And and so mm -hmm. moving for performance reasons may not be uh, highly motivating. But in other cases where you're perpetually setting up and tearing down applications, that flexibility that you offer. Uh, is is pretty interesting. What, what brings some more reality to that? What what types of environments, or what are your customers doing specifically where where that flexibility comes through? Okay, well, there's two pieces to it. So why don't we start with the fungible data center, which is where we deliver the networking, the storage, uh, okay. uh, the the CPU cores. So in that case, you are spot on that. The value is um, more fully realized as the customer environment is more dynamic. So, if I let you compose, you know, logically compose machines on the fly and logically decompose them on the fly, but your environment changes once every five years, that's not going to be useful to you because <laughs> you're, you're going to set it up once and never need to change you it. Be done with it, right? Um, but if you are a large multi-tenant environment, if you have a huge, you know, a number of developers, you know, spinning up test environments and needing to spin them down, traditionally in those cases, a lot, a lot of companies buy a test environment every time another development group wants to do test, and then when it's done, it sits dormant or almost dormant until another group needs a test environment, and instead of remembering that last one's there you go and you buy another one. And that's why, you know, utilization in enterprise data centers and aggregate tends to be 30% or less. Um, so what we allow, uh, if you think of traditionally how you would configure a server, you know, you think of, you know, what does this workload need? And based on what it needs, I'm gonna pick a number of cores, a speed of cores, how much memory, if you're putting storage in it, you'll pick an amount of storage. You know, instead of doing that server by server by server, you now do that for your whole data center. And you say, in aggregate, I'm going to need 2,000 cores, three petabytes of storage, X amount of bandwidth. Mm -hmm. um, and you can, com you know, logically stitch that and unstitch it together um, however you like. So for the data center, the top to bottom with the composability, that dynamism really matters. On the storage cluster front, uh, it's more about the performance requirements and the, and the need for future growth. 
because uh, with a true scale out architecture like ours, like any time you add a node, you get another 15 million IOPS, which is really nice. Um, you also get more bandwidth. Uh, you get more capacity. Uh, the data uh, re-spreads itself out, so every node in your cluster is nicely balanced and evenly allocated. So if you think of uh, from a store, you know the the capabilities you get with that scale out system. Um, one of the advantages is you don't need to buy anything before you really need it, um, because um, you know as long as you give us a couple of weeks' notice to get you a node, as soon as we plug that node in, immediately the performance is available to you, the capacity is available to sure. you, the data restripes itself out just like that node had been in the cluster forever, um, and there's a lot of efficiencies for customers because it's really hard and increasingly hard for customers to, to figure out what their requirements are gonna be three or five years from now. So if you think of a traditional scale up architecture, like this is a little overly simplified, but most customers or companies offer small, medium, or large. Mm -hmm. And if you're, a, if you're a client, you say, I know I need a medium. I really think I need a medium, but if I'm wrong, it's really expensive and onerous and time consuming to turn it into a large later. So I'll go buy a large just in case I need it. Mm -hmm. And X, you know, three, four or five years down the road, you know, you're, you're making that same decision again, where with, with an architecture like ours, um, you know, once the data is there, you're never migrating it. You can always make any data set more performant by just adding more nodes into the cluster. And then with the uh, quality of service capabilities, you can assign whatever level of performance you want to any of those volumes. Well, it's very, um, especially at the fungible data center level, it's very cloud-like, right? When mm -hmm. you go to Amazon or Google or whatever and create your, your, your machines, I mean, you're picking cores, you're picking instance types, you're picking, you're making those those decisions, you're picking amount of storage, and and so that's not that's not dissimilar with what you're doing uh, here. It's just on prem and and within your control. Um, thinking about application types, though, in 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 highly dynamic organizations, what's the fungible story when it comes to containers? And then I'm going to kind of shrink back a little bit when I say this one: virtualization. Okay, um, I'll start with containers. Um, so we are um, the design point for the for the fungible data center uh, was a bare metal cloud uh, with the assumption that there would likely be uh, containers running on it um, and the integrations are there and really nicely done from a uh, from a virtualization end. Um, uh, we don't see it as much playing in in that space because we feel what what customers would be building with the data center are probably uh, like I mentioned earlier, you know, more bare metal like environments and mm -hmm. that are running more of you know more of their greenfield workloads, which emerging applications, as they would say, right. Yeah, which generally aren't as virtualized. Uh, okay. Now we do actually have uh, on our store within the, the DPU, we do have a light hypervisor uh, that's actually within the DPU. Okay, interesting. Um, so let me ask you another architectural question. As, as you go through and you talk about this, one of the things that, that keeps jumping into my head is uh, the guys at DSSD you know, they were trying to solve a problem of getting flash more uh, cl closer to the CPUs of the of the uh, hosts or, or client servers. And one of the ways they were doing that was there were a bunch of fancy PCIe bridging, but ultimately it required a DSSD NIC or HBA in every single machine and every single host. And they really stumbled on that hardware requirement. 
not because of any sort of compatibility problem with any of the servers. You could use any server with it. Um, but ultimately, customers didn't really care for that implementation type. Now, I know your your setup is different, but you still require these, these dedicated hardware components. How are you bridging that issue with your customers? Is there less of concern these days? Or I, I'm just wondering if that's a hang up at all and how you're uh, accommodating that. Uh, I can't speak to the DSSD analogy just because I don't, I don't know enough about DSSD. Uh, from uh, with us, from a portfolio perspective, um, the storage cluster requires nothing that goes into the client machines. So no custom soft, no, they don't have to layer on any other software or install any other hardware to take advantage okay. of what the storage cluster offers. So there, uh, it is just a non-issue. When we get to the, the fungible data center, um, uh, it coexists. So the network layer that provides the composability sits on top of TCP. Uh, so it coexists with existing customer networks. So they okay. don't, it's not an all or nothing as far as when you deploy it, but certain attributes of, of uh, the fungible data center won't be as valuable if you don't have our cards in those servers. Um, okay. So the customers can decide where to put them and where not to put them. But again, with uh, with the with the data center, it tends to be more greenfield environments where it's less of an issue. And with the storage cluster, it tends to be more brownfield environments. And in those cases, again, the customers don't have to, you know, we just look, we're just a, a, a block store. So two distinct, you know, products, the, the complete data center, which is in the box and ready to go, and you can add as you want. The storage is separate. What about the the DPU itself? Is that something that you'll license? You are licensing, or would we see that uh, come into uh, products from other companies, other vendors? Is tell me about that. Uh, we we don't generally offer it uh, okay. to most of the market, um, but we do offer it for uh, potential very high volume purchasers. So think hyperscalers. Mm -hmm. potentially traditional IT manufacturers that would want to be able to deliver some of the, the advantages we've been able to prove the DPU is capable of with our storage cluster. Maybe they'd want to enable some of those in their own products where we'd be talking, you know, tens or, or hundreds of thousands of DPUs a year um, mm -hmm. for the uh, you know, vast, vast majority of the market. It's the fungible data center or the fungible storage cluster. So in a little bit of a technical glitch during our recording yesterday, you'll notice different uh, drinks and shirts on, uh, on myself and our participant. Uh, Brian had a power outage when he was in the middle of my question. I don't think he was trying to dodge the question because he came back today to, to finish the podcast. So we're going to pick up where we left off, but uh, if there's any sort of bumps in the feed or, or audio or... I forgot what I asked yesterday and I asked him the question a second time. That's why it's a little bit disjointed. But uh, Brian, glad to have you back. It looks like you have power again. Yes, and uh, on, on behalf of uh, New York State Electricity and Gas, I apologize <laughs> for, the, uh, for the issue yesterday. Yeah, no problem. What I was asking you as your, your power dropped was... Uh, was really around, you know, how, how do you guys think about the products and, and where you expect to see traction? Because you've got the whole stack in the in the fungible data center. You've got the um, the 1600 storage node and, of course, the, the DPU itself. But I'm curious about the storage node specifically. It, it seems like that's the easier in for a start, a, a POC or a startup opportunity for you guys to sell into. Do you expect that to be the bulk of your business versus the data center, uh, the full data center stack? Uh, we're still learning exactly what the breakdown will be. But to your point, the storage cluster is absolutely the easier in. Um, so for, for me as a, as a go to marketing sales person, uh, it's always easier to sell into an existing budget category. 
So with our storage cluster, there's an established budget category, there's an established decision process, there are established decision makers, and there's a compelling value prop compared to traditional offerings. And you just need to find those buyers that what's compelling about you is meaningful to them. Um, and mm -hmm. so they tend to be easier to qualify, shorter sales cycles, and that'll be the higher volume of our transactions. So you'd mentioned the DPUs and uh, for very high volume consumers, so think hyperscalers or think even traditional infrastructure product providers that want to be able to provide the benefits we provide across our offerings, potentially embedded in their offerings, either in their clouds or in the, the products they are taking to market. So those, that, those will not be a high quantity of opportunities, but they will be very, very, very large opportunities. And there are several of those in play. And the data center, um, you know, that that's kind of a new market. And the good news part is the messaging is in, extremely uh, resonant in that customers know that they want to be in a world like that. Um, it's just a matter of when they want to be there. And another thing that can be challenging with it from a go-to-market end is it, it hits every part of the stack. So if you're dealing with a customer where the people that make networking decisions are different than the people who make storage decisions, you know, then it's a more complicated, longer sales cycle. And one of the things to me that's really exciting about Fungible's model, uh, like we talked about yesterday, is you can start with tactical solutions and grow into a fully composable, hyper-disaggregated environment, or you can start start at, at your endpoint and you know lay out your workflow, workloads and applications from there. Okay. So as you think about um, sticking with the storage uh, product, as you think about where you'll find that success and getting that into to market, especially in the enterprise, I mean, you guys are kind of shipping your own thing at the moment, or are you also using third-party servers? How does that work from, a, from the box standpoint? Uh, other than the DPU, the components in the box are all standard. So they're standard SSDs, memory standard. Um, uh, they are custom designed chassis for us. And you know, one of the interesting things about our chassis is if you crack the, the cover on them, they are totally DPU powered. Um, so uh, every piece of functionality we provide, a customer knows is, is DPU powered, DPU accelerated and comes with all those advantages. So it's not like there's a hidden general purpose CPU in there that's, you know, doing it's a, encryption. It's interesting. Okay, so if we if we pulled apart a, a typical storage array controller, there would be generally an Intel CPU in there, there'd be four sticks of, of RAM, there'd be a lot lots of other components in there times two, right? For yep. for an active active controller. Uh, so you've got no no main CPU, no Intel CPU in there at all? Nope. Oh, okay. This uh, is a it's, really... It's fully DPU powered. And I mean, that's, it's, it's and a that, different and I, way of thinking, right? Yeah, and you know, it takes a little longer to come to market that way because you can't... You know, the bad news is it takes longer to get things done because you got to do it yourself. The good news is every time you deliver something, it's better. So it's so, closer to a JBOD with your DPUs in it rather than a, a typical compute node. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. And a lot of the traditional storage products, you know, from a hardware end, they, they kind of look like servers with a bunch of storage slots. Mm -hmm. So that's that's not that's not us. So how do you then take advantage of of new technologies like PCIe Gen 4 or you know, something like that where where that's reliant on the host chipset. If we're removing that from your equation, then then how do you 
get to new technology like that? You've got to program it yourself. Um, depending what the technology is, it, we either need initiators, drivers, some level of, of way to interoperate with it. But for, for things like drives, which are, you know, primarily what we need to keep up with, mm -hmm. um, you know, there, there aren't any issues in integrating those really, really quickly. And, you know, you'll see over the coming months, um, incremental announcements from us in, in that regard. Okay. Are there redundancy concerns that customers have? Uh, I mean, anytime you do something different, uh, it just requires a pivot in the way customers think about how they consume these things. Do you have customers that worry about the high availability or maybe I need twice as many DPUs in the system because I'm worried about one failing? Like, how, how do they think about that? Yeah, I'd say most every customer's high availability concerned. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a it's a discussion topic in almost every sales cycle. Uh, the architecture is there from a, a hardware perspective, so there aren't single points of failure or anything like that. What gets really interesting with us because we use uh, erasure coding, so we are an EBS-like data protection mechanism, uh, and we control data placement really well across nodes that we by default provide rack resiliency because of uh, our, our adaptation of, of EBS that is you know, really hard if not impossible for a traditional storage architecture that's using like controller-based RAID or something okay. like that to accomplish. So if you had a 10 node cluster, you could have each node in a separate rack and you could then lose multi if you lost multiple racks for whatever reason. Sure. Um, you know, up to a certain failure domain that you would select, you wouldn't have any concerns about data availability. Okay. So you talked about um, upcoming announcements around new technology support, maybe new drives or capacities or something. Mm -hmm. I won't. I won't uh, to force you into uh, NDA territory and get in trouble with the uh -huh. uh, corporate overlords. Um, relatively new product, where do you have to continue to enhance? I mean, these things typically it's like data services where there's the next step is, you know, snapshotting, data protection, what, you know, other, other features and, and enhancements, additional support for uh, networking protocols. What are you guys focused on for the next you know, quarter or two that's not super secret about what you feel like you need to add to the product? Uh, the, I think there's two phases companies go through in that um, and that we are going through. First is you have to get your, your differentiation nailed. Mm -hmm. So for us, it is performance. It's the way we do data protection. It's the resiliency of our scale out distributed architecture. Um, and, you know, that needs to be something, you know, you can hang your hat on forever. Uh, and then there ends up being, you know, a whole set of kind of cover charge features. Um, like an example might be, you know, we require real-time replication to a second data center for our entire data set. Um, and no matter how much they love everything about us until we have that feature. Yeah, um, it's a no-go. You know, then it's a no-go. Like we have a, uh, uh, by the time this drops, a version of the code coming out that will have snapshots where we haven't had snapshots before. So there's been some amount of pent up customer demand waiting for snapshots. And mm -hmm. then that, so, you know, we, we uh, uh, you know, we know what the uh, list is of sort of traditional features and which, <clears throat> which ones are important to our customers and we'll tick them off one by one and what I tell our, our teams is if we go in, like we have a really interesting story. So if we go in and we tell it well, assuming it's an, a, you know, somebody that cares about our market space and understands what we do, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean you'll sell it there, but you will get them really interested and excited. And there may be they may not have a project at this point. They may not have budget at this point. They may require snapshots and you don't have it yet. 
Um, but if we go in and do a great job telling our story, that door will always be open to us. And and we're going to add increasingly layer on those other features. And each time we do, our, our addressable market expands. Yep. Yeah, yeah. You start spreading those ripples out and uh, and now you can hit more of those use cases, uh, mm-hmm. which makes sense. Um well, this is really interesting for customer or prospective customers or, or for people that want to go play with this or see it. What resources do you have available short of a full POC um, to explore uh, the capabilities further? Or what's the sales cycle looking like? What are you walking customers through demos live? I mean, what are the, the options there to learn more? Yeah, we, we uh, tend to have an introductory meeting that goes half an hour to an hour. Uh, if it looks like there's a fit between, you know, their needs and our offerings, then it'll be an hour to two hour deeper dive. Uh, okay. If it then makes sense to for testing, uh, the easiest way to do it is we have a very robust POC environment um, mm-hmm. uh, that I believe you've seen and are mm-hmm. used, and uh, uh, and that's a great way to do functionality testing to verify our performance claims. Uh, if after that there's reasons there needs to be an on-site POC. Maybe there's data sets you need to test that can't leave your, your premise or something like that. Sure. Uh, that's also an available option. Uh, yeah, and to be fair, we have done, um, oh gosh, probably about an hour, hour and a half in terms of going through with your technical team and getting the walkthrough on how it works. The um, uh, the UI is intuitive. I mean, it's it's pretty straightforward for what it is. Sometimes those things can be a little bumpy early on, but uh, uh, your team's got it pretty tight. Um, and I, I just have I'm, to. Sorry. Well, I was just going to say we might just have to keep pushing your team a little bit to get a couple of these bad boys in here. Yeah. I know Kevin's itching to to put those to work. Yeah, and I think what you know, one of the things customers really want to see in the environment is that the 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 parts they care about from a differentiation end are there. Mm-hmm. And that other than that, it looks exactly like what they're used to. So it's not going to require a massive new management framework or overhead or a thousand pages of new run books that, mm-hmm. you know, they're going to get the performance, they're going to get the availability, they're going to get the agility, and it's just going to slide in it's from a storage cluster end, it's going to slide into their environment and and be none or near near no management overhead for them going forward. Well, yeah, I mean we're we're excited. Uh, I'm not sure if you caught it, but uh, Chris Miller and I did a podcast a number of weeks ago, and he called out you guys as one of his uh, you know really interesting companies to watch. We were talking a little bit about Composable um, then and some of the others in the space then. You know, kind of back where we started, where a lot of people have tried this and haven't had tremendous success. Um, but your approach is, um, it's nuanced, but it's entirely different in terms of the uh, the hardware underlying it and your sort of fundamental view on, on what you're trying to do. So, you know, we're, we're op- optimis- optimistic onlookers, I suppose. Yeah. And, uh, and, and like I said, uh, we'll keep banging on your team to get uh, something in here so we can do a deeper dive on the, the performance and the, the technicals. But, uh, you know, until then, we certainly appreciate you um, joining us on the podcast, putting a little more information out there about what Fungible's up to. And uh, uh, any parting words, Brian? I'll give you well, the last shot. Uh, thank you for giving me uh, day two. <laughs> After yeah, that was a first problem. It makes me think, uh, uh, you know, we need an electricity grid that's as resilient as our storage cluster, or at least around where I live. So uh, um, not in like like we talked about prior to, to getting on. I really enjoyed the conversation. And, um, you, you know, thank you for keep, you know, for having a lot of depth to it. All right. Thank you, Brian. And uh, guys, thanks for tuning into the podcast, whether you're on the audio stream on your favorite podcast player or checking us out on YouTube. We appreciate your support. Thanks.